Hello, everyone. Welcome to our new series of online seminars. My name is Teko Mohozi. I'm a member of the FIG Education Commission. Our topic today is lost skill syndrome, and I'm very happy to introduce our guests who will talk about this topic is Mr. Thomas Heinen. Uh, Thomas, uh, welcome, and we're very happy to have you with us. Thank you very much, Tseko, and also thanks to the FIG for giving this opportunity to give this lecture in front of this auditorium of experts in gymnastics. I'm looking forward to discuss a few aspects related to the phenomenon of lost skill syndrome with you. Thank you so much. So to talk a little bit about Thomas, uh, Thomas studied uh, sports science at the German Sports University in Cologne, where he also received his PhD in psychology and biomechanics. He was a professor for social science of sports at the University of Hildesheim in Germany. Uh, he currently works as a professor for movement and training science at Leipzig University in gymnastics and martial arts. Uh, primary research interests are related to the role of perception and cognition in the selection, control, and acquisition of complex skills. He was a former gymnast, and in his leisure time, Thomas uh, practices capoeira and produces electronic dance music. Uh, once again, uh, Thomas, thank you so much. Um, lost skill syndrome, uh, we will hear in detail about what this is all about from you. But many people have experienced this uh, as a gymnast and as a coach. Uh, a gymnast who has been performing a certain skill for a long time and well, and then suddenly they struggle or somehow can't perform the skill anymore. So I feel I have to ask this question. How real is this uh, phenomenon and is it a widespread problem? Yes, I think the phenomenon is very real. It has a high prevalence rate of about 80% in these technical sports, but Often it's not communicated so intense in the community and some gymnasts experienced it, but then they switched to another skill and then it's not a severe problem anymore for them. And it's also very widespread in other technical sports. So it's not restricted to artistic gymnastics, but it also occurs in trampoline gymnastics, in springboard diving. There's also one case described in javelin throw but mostly the technical sports in which you will find the lost skill syndrome, I guess. All right, thank you for that. Uh, once you're ready, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you again, Seko. I'm now looking forward to discuss a few aspects related to the phenomenon of lost skill syndrome in the next minutes. So, hello everyone, dear coaches and colleagues, many thanks for the opportunity to give this lecture in front of this auditorium of experts in gymnastics. I am looking forward to discuss a few aspects related to the phenomenon of lost skill syndrome. Um, after a short introduction, I want to present several definitions and characteristics of the lost skill syndrome, as well as a model of lost skill syndrome development. The second part of my talk comprises a case study of a trampoline gymnast that suffered from lost skill, but who was able to successfully get rid of the syndrome. In this context, I want to describe several intervention strategies that were used with the aforementioned gymnast. And I will end up with a short summary and a conclusion. So let us now start with a short introduction. There are a lot of different terms in the literature used in the context of losing skills in sports but they all have several aspects in common. However, this also shows that there may be some differentiation in the phenomenon that we speak about, depending on where it occurs and what consequences it has for a particular athlete. Some authors, for instance, call it slump, whereas others associate it more with some sort of mental block or call it temporal skill confusion. So lost move or lost skill syndrome occurs most often in acrobatic sports, such as artistic gymnastics or trampoline gymnastics. It also occurs in springboard diving. And there is also one case described in the literature in javelin throw. Lost skill syndrome has a prevalence rate of about 80% in these sports and several short-term consequences such as injury. There are also several long-term consequences, such as the permanent loss of motor skills. 
sudden appearance of lost skill syndrome often goes along with the loss of spatial orientation throughout the skill, sometimes resulting in a movement that was not intended. Lost skill syndrome is not restricted to expert gymnasts, but also occurs in intermediates. Here you see two definitions of lost skill syndrome by different authors. And uh, not to be confused, lost move syndrome and lost skill syndrome, these terms are often used interchangeably. I often use lost skill syndrome as a concept. So first, lost move syndrome can be described as a psychological condition in which athletes find themselves unable to perform a skill that was previously automatic. This definition is by Day and colleagues. And here you see another definition. Loss move syndrome is characterized by a sudden and temporary loss of fine and or gross motor control, manifesting as locked, stuck or frozen movement. A central finding associated loss move syndrome to feeling like someone or something other than the athlete was in control for a momentary period of time. This definition is by Bennett and colleagues. So taken together, lost move syndrome or lost skill syndrome has been described as a condition that sees the athlete lose awareness of body position and the ability to execute a particular technique or skill, often performing involuntary twists, rotations and body positions, or being unable to execute the skills at all. Gymnasts usually show an inability to take off for at least one somersault when previously able, an inability to perform a somersault with a certain degree of twist, switching to a different skill midway through when previously able to perform the desired skill, and an inability to land a particular skill when previously able. We did a short survey during the Trampoline World Championships in 2015, and here you see one result. So 80% of the gymnasts that we asked said that they experienced lost skill syndrome at least once during their career. And this pretty much conforms to the literature. So lost skill syndrome occurred with the highest frequency in skills such as Fliffis or Fliffis Rudy, followed by a double back or full in, followed by whips or back somersaults. For the Fliffis, the situation usually was that gymnasts over-rotated the somersault. For double back, they usually performed an additional twist without wanting so. And for whips or back somersaults, it usually came to a breakdown before or during the takeoff. There are several aspects that characterize the lost skill syndrome and I want to summarize them on this slide. Day and colleagues conducted one of the most comprehensive study examining lost skill or lost move syndrome. They explored the psychological causes of and responses to the lost skill syndrome in trampoline gymnasts. And I highly recommend that you uh, read the study. It's quite helpful when being a coach or a sports psychologist in gymnastics, trampoline gymnastics and other fields. So the authors suggested that lost skill syndrome could be traced back to an inadequate skill acquisition, which when coupled with pressure from various sources led to a series of negative emotional reactions with subsequent skill breakdown. For instance, lost skill syndrome was likely to occur when skill acquisition was either quick and easy or difficult and slow and or when there was a neglect of multi-sensory experience in skill acquisition. A second argument was that lost skill syndrome was likely to occur when gymnasts perceived heightened arousal levels and or focused on negative aspects and used negative self-talk. This often coincides with a gradual increase in fear of performing the skill, elevated levels of cognitive and or somatic anxiety, coupled with the adoption of various avoidance strategies. A third argument was that lost skill syndrome was primarily the result of a switch from automatic to conscious processing and an attempted control of an automatic movement pattern, as well as a loss in sensory motor sensitivity. 
In particular, such a switch from unconscious to conscious processing could provoke ironic processes. If you try to avoid particular things, this makes their occurrence more probable. So interestingly, Day and colleagues highlighted several emotional and cognitive factors caused by lost skill syndrome, such as crying, feelings of stupidity, even depression. And furthermore, it was suggested that psychologically significant experiences in sport, such as injury, failure, etc., were equivalent to some sort of trauma experience and triggered comparable behavioral responses to those of trauma victims, such as high levels of anxiety, fear, even panic. We already discussed the definition and characteristics of lost skill syndrome. I now want to discuss a model of lost skill development, which has several implications for practical applications. When there is no lost skill syndrome present, the athlete usually builds an intention to perform a particular skill and selects a particular motor pattern. So this normally leads to an intended execution of the skill or routine. The control of the skill is usually influenced by temporal and spatial constraints that are pretty much task dependent. So this differs depending on which sport you are in. Social constraints such as being observed by significant others such as other gymnasts or coach or like, are also likely to influence motor control. When lost skill syndrome occurs, however, there is usually a sudden breakdown in motor control, which often results in some serious fall or injury. This breakdown in motor control coincides with a loss in spatial orientation which in turn often triggers unintended movements that overlay the current movements. An example would be that a gymnast wanted to perform a straight somersault with a half twist, but performed one and a half twist instead. This breakdown in motor control usually triggers an emotional and physiological response, which goes along with a changed cognitive activity. This is quite similar to a stress response. A changed cognitive activity is likely to result in a changed or biased perception, which in turn provokes a different attentional focus. And the described process here can be seen as a negative circle that more and more leads to a manifestation of lost skill syndrome. Indeed, it is possible that the lost skill syndrome endures as a result of an entrapment in a continuous cycle of rumination, coupled with negative expectations and perceived loss of control during movement execution. So you stand on the trampoline, you want to perform the intended skill, and it simply doesn't work. You have a strong emotional response, you think about what's happening, your perception changes, your attentional focus changes, you're away from the skill with your attention, you're more on your feelings, on your anxiety maybe whatsoever. And this is some sort of negative circle that can stabilize itself from trial to trial. And one term that appears to capture the shared experience described by participants is performance block. So it feels like hitting a wall and you're stuck. And again, these blocks are characterized by a sudden and temporary loss of motor and cognitive control. And they manifest as locked, stuck or frozen movements with feelings of anxiety, fear or even panic. Often lost skill syndrome has a rather escalating nature because it can become a career terminating event. And it can also have a wider impact. It may generalize to other skills and may also lead to controlling other areas of life. 
If there is a manifestation of lost skill syndrome, one additional negative side effect is that the athlete may exhibit significant changes in movement pattern and also a stabilization of such a changed movement pattern. For instance, you have the intention to perform a straight somersault with a full twist, but you perform a straight somersault with two twists instead. So this stabilizes relative to the intention that you had in performing a particular skill. And this can be super confusing for the athlete, of course. When looking at the model just elaborated, there are several techniques in sports psychology that may help to overcome the lost skill syndrome. You can, for instance, try to relearn the skill by changing motor training. Uh, with a particular emphasis on routine development and also multi-sensory experiences. So try to change the experience that an athlete gains during motor learning in a multi-sensory way that is very broad, very intense, that may help to overcome such automatic processes when trying to perform skills. You can also do imagery training or even hypnosis with a specific emphasis on vividness and controllability. You often find that athletes suffering from lost skill have huge problems making up their mind, generating images about the skill in question. These images are hard to control, are not very clear. So Emphasizing vividness and controllability in imagery training can pretty much have a strong effect here. In order to cope with the emotional and physiological response, relaxation training could be helpful. There are so many options using relaxation training. I'll come back to that later. In order to deal with the changed cognitive activity, you could try to integrate strategies of self-talk, such as using particular keywords, using more and more positive self-talk, changing negative self-talk to positive self-talk, trying to reframe specific phrases, and so on. In order to deal with the changed perception, strategies of perceptual training may be helpful, such as spotting or even occlusion that may help the athlete come back to a specific perception when relearning or when regaining the skill. Attention control training in terms of focusing can help to deal with a different attentional focus that may come up during this cycle. And you could also try to integrate a so-called five-step routine that incorporates several of the aforementioned techniques. And I highly recommend this technique. I also come back to this later. I also highly recommend the idea of prediction training. This can be used with very high creativity and it can also be coupled with video analysis. I also come back to that later. So usually participants discuss attempting to overcome lost skill syndrome using more and more cognitive methods, for example, relaxation techniques, positive self-talk, distraction methods, imagery, and so on. However, cognitive methods alone may not be that effectively to treat lost skill syndrome. It seems as if a combined mind intervention program seems to be most effective in the treatment of lost skill syndrome. Having said that, I now want to come to a case study of a trampoline gymnast who suffered from lost skill syndrome. The situation was that he was previously being able to perform a piped flippers, but he suddenly lost control during one performance and crashed. After this crash, he was not able to perform the skill anymore, not because he injured himself, but because he experienced a strong stress-like reaction when trying to perform the skill again after his crash. And this stress-like reaction almost started when he 
climbed on the trampoline. So it was enough for him to just stand there thinking I have to perform this skill again and that, that's it. When working together with the gymnast we used several sources of information to get an initial idea and also to be able to formulate initial hypothesis on where to start. So first we used interviews with him of course but also with significant others such as other gymnasts, the coach and so on. We used training protocols to see what happened in the past, so what was the content of the training program, were there any specific sports psychological methods already used and so on. And we also used observation in the training situation to get an idea on how he usually behaves in daily training. The perspective here was a skill development perspective. That is to say that we want to, to identify psychological skills that were less developed or were restricted as a result of lost skill syndrome. So the initial hypothesis was that we should find some restrictions on the following levels or in the following skills activation, relaxation, concentration, self-talk and also imagery. In the next step we use standardized diagnostic tools for an in-detail examination of the aforementioned aspects. Using different instruments we did some psychological profiling on the factors that are shown in the slide. The first group of factors was assessed by the test of performance strategies and the psychological skills inventory for sports. These are two standardized questionnaires that can be applied in virtually any sport. We used another two performance tests to assess concentration and visual search, namely the D2 test and the concentration grid test. The vividness of movement imagery questionnaire was used to assess vividness of imagery and the Competitive State Anxiety Inventory 2 was used to assess dimensions of anxiety and self-confidence. The measures were set transformed with regard to the norms of the instruments. The scores are therefore scaled with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Every time a score is smaller than minus 1 or larger than plus 1, this gives a hint that the skill is either below or above average. When you take an in-detail look at the figure, you see that aspects such as activation in training, activation in competition, relaxation in training and so on are clearly below average, whereas aspects such as negative cognitions, self-talk in competition, but also sport motivation are clearly above average. Concentration was below average vividness of external imagery, cognitive anxiety was clearly above average, self-confidence was below average. So it seems as if the athlete is highly motivated for his sport, but has some problems and some skills that were either below average, so could be increased to some degree, or were above average, so some things that could be reduced here. I wanted to show you one example for a diagnostic tool here. This is the vividness of movement imagery questionnaire that we used to assess vividness of movement imagery. And the task of the gymnast is to imagine different motor skills and always indicate the vividness when imagining the task between no image at all, you only know that you are thinking of the skill, to perfectly clear and as vivid as normal vision. The VIMIC uses different perspectives, such as an ego perspective and an external perspective. And you usually find that gymnasts suffering from lost skill syndrome has difficulties in imagining even easy and simple motor skills from their sport. So these are the motor skills that are used in the original version, 
of the VIMIC, but it's always helpful to have the gymnasts try to imagine skills from their sport. Maybe skills that are close to the skill where the lost skill syndrome appeared. This usually gives you a quite good indication on how strong already some generalization occurred or if it's still such an isolated problem with one particular skill. So having an ego perspective, you ask the gymnast to imagine him or herself when looking through his or her own eyes. When using an external perspective, you ask the gymnast to imagine him or herself when being observed by an external camera. So given the results from the psychological profiling of the gymnast here, the following training program was developed. Uh, this program consisted of these four blocks. We used motor training with a specific emphasis on systematic desensitization with an integration of video feedback. We used a five-step routine here highlighting the action structure and key points of the lost skill. We used some relaxation training uh, with a particular focus on task-specific demands in trampoline gymnastics. And this also should support the five-step routine. And finally, we used prediction training also integrated with video feedback. For motor training, when a gymnast loses a skill, it could be necessary to go some steps back and try to relearn whatever that means to the skill. So one quite effective strategy here was proposed by Gentile and it comprises the four steps shown on the slide. When the skill or parts of the skill is acquired or relearned, you should start with situations in which the gymnast experiences neither intertrial variability nor body transport. The gymnast would, for instance, just try to work on specific poses, postures of the skill, and sensory information should be as broad, multisensory, and intense as possible. So step one. The second step integrates intertrial variability. That is, the gymnast performs the poses, postures, or movements from step one under situations of changing variability from trial to trial. For instance, when working on a simple handstand, you would change for the underground on which the handstand is performed from trial to trial. Or doing a handstand with closed eyes would be another form of integrating intertrial variability, and so on and so on. Again, sensory information should be as broad and intense as possible. In the third step, intertrial variability is reduced, but body transport is integrated. If we stay with the handstand example, the handstand is now performed on a moving underground, such as a skateboard or a trampoline or whatever. The last step comprises intertrial variability and body transport. An example would be performing a handstand on a shaky surface with open and closed eyes from trial to trial. You could also try to increase the spatial awareness and visual perception aspect of specific skills. And in the past, we also used such rotation devices in athletes suffering from lost skills for them. And this was quite effective. We did not so much research there, but it was more a feeling that this was quite an effective strategy. So if you have something at hand, I would say just give it a try. A super effective psychological strategy for gymnastics is the so-called five-step approach or five-step routine. When developing skill routines, the approach was first described by Singer for technical sports and I used it a lot when working together with gymnasts but also with athletes from other sports. 
The idea is that you go through several structured steps prior to skill execution. These steps give a clear action structure and they also have diverse effects on emotion regulation and anxiety. So the first step is called readying. This would comprise sport-specific activities such as going to the trampoline, adjusting your socks or whatever you need to be ready to perform the skill. The second step is called imagining. This is a short but functional mental rehearsal of the most important key points in the skill. So no rehearsal of the complete skill or routine, but only the most important key points. The third step is called focusing. And here you try to direct your attention to some external cue and leave it there, at least during the initial part of the skill. You execute the skill with a quiet mind. Whatever thoughts pop up, just let them go without paying attention to them. And then you evaluate your skill execution. What was good, what was not good here. The coach may help you, you can use video analysis and this gives you feedback for the next attempt. So once this five step approach has been developed for one skill, it easily generalizes to other skills and situations. And if the gymnast has trouble, for instance, with imagining or focusing, this always gives you a good indication that further techniques such as imagery or intention control training could be integrated here. So I highly recommend to give this strategy a try in your daily training. Relaxation training should be part of every training session, I guess. Maybe not of every, maybe every second or so, depending on how much time you have. Usually you would think of it as it is shown in the picture, but there are so many techniques that could be used to control your activation level that it is impossible to give particular advice on that. So usually you decide on what the gymnast likes. In general, there are three categories, mind to body techniques, focus on a mental intervention that should lead to bodily sensations. So something to think of a top down process, um, autogenic training, meditation, hypnosis, or even listening to music are typical examples here. When using body to mind techniques, so more bottom up, the gymnast uses muscular activity that is likely to change the mental state, such as doing relaxed dancing, progressive relaxation, yoga. The assumption here is that you can't be anxious on a cognitive level when being in a relaxed bodily state. So multimodal techniques comprise a sometimes easy and sometimes quite complex package of diverse techniques to bring the gymnast in an emotional balanced state. There are concepts such as stress inoculation training, visual motor behavior rehearsal and so on and so on. And I would say that it's quite advisable that you stay in contact with a trained sports psychologist to find the most adequate technique that can be applied for each individual gymnast in your club. Another psychological technique, and this is the last that I want to discuss, is called prediction training. And this training can be used for virtually any task in gymnastics. The main goal of prediction training is to develop or stabilize gymnasts' level of self-confidence. In the first step, there's the definition of the task and the prediction of the outcome. So the coach defines a task, for instance, five somersaults with perfect landing, and the gymnast predicts the outcome. For instance, five out of uh, four out of five will be successful. The second step is called task execution and observation. The gymnast executes the task and the coach counts the successful attempts. After that, you want to evaluate was the prediction correct and if not, was, what was the problem? A critical evaluation about prediction versus task difficulty versus performance versus gymnast skill level is important to make the result of the training significant for the gymnast 
and therefore likely to enhance or stabilize his or her level of self-confidence. Prediction training can also be coupled with video feedback in a sense that the gymnast has to give a prediction about skill performance in terms of kinematics rather than a specific result or outcome. Finally, prediction training can also comprise group performance or it can be coupled with particular consequences or stress induction techniques, making it quite a flexible tool for many situations in high performance gymnastics. So finally, after six weeks of training, we again used the diagnostic tools with the gymnast and here you can see the results. Pre means six weeks back and post after six weeks of training. There were some significant changes in several aspects such as activation training, activation competition and so on are more now in the average area here, no more, no longer below average. He is still highly motivated for his sport. Concentration got an increase here. Vividness of imagery got an increase here. Cognitive anxiety got a decrease here. And self-confidence also an increase here. So quite some strong changes. Maybe as a result of the training, but of course you can never be sure. But apart from the changes in the psychological skills, he was now able to perform the fliffes again in a very controlled situation with a coach standing close to the trample line holding a security, uh, sorry, a safety mat. And this was quite a good success for the gymnast here. And of course, every trial that you perform that works, every successful attempt supports your self-confidence, of course. So you get control back, you see that you can do it, that lost skill situation more and more vanishes. And this, and this is quite an important experience for the gym. So we are coming towards the end of my talk. I want to give a short summary and a conclusion. We started by defining lost skill syndrome and there is consensus that lost skill syndrome is primarily a psychological condition. However, there is also research from phenomena such as the yips in golf or focal dystonia in musicians, from which one could speculate that that lost skill syndrome might have some neurophysiological dimension. For instance, in focal dystonia, there is evidence that areas in the motor cortex overlap to some degree in highly overlearned tasks. And this may contribute to unwanted effects on the level of motor control. So it's quite a serious condition in acrobatic sports and should be handled with care. Lost skill syndrome, however, cannot be induced experimentally and therefore research will be limited to the cases that occur naturally. Nevertheless, researching is of high importance for gymnastics and similar sports. As we discussed, it can become manifest in several aspects, such as emotional responses and so on, and it may also generalize to other aspects so that it gets more and more the um, nature of a career terminating event. And this is quite a problem here. However, the techniques that we discussed are not only useful in the treatment of lost skill syndrome. Psychological interventions may be most effective here. Mm, but they may also be used in daily training with the aim of general psychological skills development or potentially to prevent lost skill syndrome from occurring. One particular effective strategy was Singer's five-step routine, and I would suggest trying to use this approach in daily training with gymnasts of all age groups. In the last part of my talk, I gave a short overview of a case study with one gymnast suffering from lost skill syndrome. This can only be a small impression because usually you will have to deal with a broad range of individual strengths and weaknesses in gymnastics, not only when it comes to lost skill syndrome. And my advice would be to work together with an experienced sports psychologist here. However, instead of using such classical approaches, a combined or multimodal approach may be suited best in the treatment of lost skill syndrome. 
Finally, integrating psychological skills training in daily practice may also reduce the dropout rate due to psychological problems that may develop in gymnastics. So there are a lot of highly talented gymnasts that never make it to the top, not only because they suffer from lost skill syndrome, but because they suffer from a broad range of other psychological problems. And this is not a good situation, of course, and we should try to avoid it at all costs. So many thanks for your patience and attention listening to my talk. Feel free to contact me anytime and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Thomas, uh, for sharing this information. Um, gave us an understanding of what happens really with lost skill syndrome and especially for sharing the techniques on dealing with this. It's interesting that uh, with most things, prevention is better than cure. So I have a few questions that I would like to ask you. The first one is um, some people say when you have a hard fall, you should get up and go again immediately. What is your opinion on this? Does it work? Thank you, Tseko, for this question. I think a lot of coaches want to have an exact answer on that. But I think it still pretty much depends on the situation. So if it was quite a hard fall and the gymnast injured him or herself, it won't be advisable to try to perform the skill immediately after the fall. If he or she is still able to perform on the trampoline, it might depend on if it was a lost skill situation or not. So if you had a loss of spatial orientation during the skill, this let you fall on the trampoline, it is likely that this repeats immediately when you try to perform the skill again. And this is a risk I don't want to put my gymnast under. So maybe it's advisable to restructure something when performing. So if lost skill happened during a forward somersault, you could go on the trampoline and perform a backward somersault. This should be no problem. And this gives the gymnast self-confidence that he or she can still perform on the trampoline and he or she can better cope with his or her um, cognitive and emotional response. But yeah, so I'm sorry that it's not easy to give an exact answer. I think it really depends on the situation that you're facing right at the moment. If it does happen that a gymnast experiences this uh, lost skill syndrome close to your competition, what would you recommend a coach does in this situation? I think this also depends on if the gymnast is able to restructure his routine. I wouldn't advise to perform the exact skill again during the routine in which the lost skill situation occurred. But maybe he or she is able to restructure small parts of the routine that this situation is unlikely to occur. I know that a lot of artistic gymnasts practice different variations of the same routine, and this could help to overcome this situation when it's very close to competition. But there will be some risk, of course, that, it's, that it happens during the competition. But of course, you have to uh, estimate, is it worth trying or should you not try? Depends on the competition, of course. Maybe it's a hard or tough decision. It's a tough decision, I think. But I would try to restructure the routine if this is possible. Well, we should thank you, Thomas Heinen, for this informative seminar. We hope that uh, coaches out there find this information useful to help and keep our gymnasts longer in the sport, you know, and to keep enjoying our sport. Thank you, Tseko. I completely agree with you. And thank you again for having the opportunity to give this presentation. Um, feel free to contact me anytime. You find my email address on the last slide. You can find me at Leipzig University. I'm looking forward to discuss your specific questions related to lost skill syndrome. It's quite an interesting topic. Thank you so much. Our thanks also go to the FIG Education Commission and the FIG staff for the work behind the scenes in making this series possible. For our viewers, please look out for more of our educational series on the FIG Education YouTube channel. Until next time, please all keep safe.